Even in a city as diverse as New York, an atheist can still apparently be a rarity. I learned this while fighting crime the other day when a co-worker approached me to ask about this podcast. Apparently she'd heard from one of the other masked vigilantes that I was an outspoken atheist, and she was curious. She's one of these people that was raised with religion. She accepted it without any real devotion and never really bothered to question it. To these folks, the idea of atheism is completely foreign. God's there because he was always there, and why the hell wouldn't he be there? She said she had a million questions, but since we were both on the clock, I asked her to narrow it down to one, and from her bouquet of inquiries, she plucked one that perfectly encapsulated how little she understood about the atheist worldview. Don't you want to live in a world where you're part of something larger than yourself? Of course, three words in, she's already fucked this thing up. I don't base my beliefs on the world I want to live in. I base them on the world that I do live in. To suggest otherwise betrays not just a lack of understanding about atheism, but a lack of understanding about understanding. It isn't a rejection of a world without an afterlife or a loving God or a divine plan. It's a recognition of such a world. But that's not even the dumbest thing about this question. I, I've heard it before, so I didn't give her the blank-faced glacial blink I did the first time, but I also couldn't give her the answer she deserved. I didn't have enough time to explain the vastness and limitlessness of the universe that I'm a part of, or to elaborate on the modest role I'm playing in the enormity of history, or to expound on the profundity of working one's way through life while authoring one's own path. From the perspective of a theist, the universe exists for them. It was brought into being for them, and the billions of light years around them are just a decoration. What's more, the grandest knowledge will never be known, and the grandest knowledge that will ever be known is already known. The purpose may be mysterious, but the goal's already established. The further the theistic mind wanders from the center of God's love, them, the smaller and less significant the cosmos becomes. But for a mind unleashed by the wonders of science, I know that from one perspective I'm an imperfection on a speck of dust, and from another I'm as grand as a galaxy. I know that every cell in my body is born of billions of years of evolution and that their key elements are older still, forged in the hearts of stars too massive to comprehend. When I raise my eyes to the heaven, I'm no less in wonder of them than the person who looks there to see God. When I see a dim star nearly invisible amid the endless curtain of space, I think of the journey those photons took along their epic voyage to our night sky. Thousands or millions of years ago, they're ejected from the boiling surface of some nuclear furnace at the speed of light. But what happened along the way? Did they pass a distant world where they part of some beautiful alien sunrise? Did they narrowly miss a spacecraft from some species thousands of technological years beyond our own? Did they pass by some rogue planet drifting through the abyss of interstellar space? What astonishing marvels might they have happened by on their million-year pilgrimage to my eye? But the wonders of science aren't limited to the grandiose. I can find the same awe when I look down at a community of ants or into a drop of water. I, I find that wonder when I contemplate the mundane because I know that the mystery isn't any less beautiful because it's solved. I look at the rainbow and I find that I admire it more because it was unweaved. In other words, magnets are more fun when you do know how the fuck they work. She asked me if I wanted to be part of something larger, and by that she meant some tiny little god that rules over some tiny little fraction of some tiny little world. The product of tiny little minds from the distant past that had never tasted something as grand as a light year. This is a fiction conjured by an imagination that couldn't begin to comprehend how big the cosmos truly was and how small they were in comparison. But I didn't have time to tell her all of this because somewhere out there my arch nemesis was plotting something counterintuitive and unnecessarily complicated, so I had to settle for a short answer. There's an episode of Cosmos where there's this phenomenal bit where Carl Sagan's answering questions for a bunch of kids at his old elementary school in Brooklyn. One of the kids asks him if the sun is considered part of the Milky Way, and he gets this great smile, and he says, You are considered part of the Milky Way. <laughs>